So hello everyone, my name is Lior Grebler. I'm with UCIC and uh, we help companies add voice to hardware products. Is it too loud, by the way? Okay, or it's loud to me. Um, but we help co companies add voice to hardware products um, and today I'm gonna be talking to you about voice everywhere. And I don't think I need to convince this group about the importance of voice. Um, a couple of years ago, maybe I would have to do some convincing, but today I think all of us recognize that voice is here, that everyone's using voice for everything, all the time, everywhere. Um, but what I'm gonna be talking to you about is, you know, looking ahead the next five to 10 years, for people who are starting to uh, work in voice, what are some of the opportunities that they can get ready for? And what are some of the things that they could start to think about designing? So. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with two questions that are going to seem completely irrelevant um, and hopefully by the end of it they'll have some relevance, but they're going to be a little bit of a, of a detour. So the first question that I want you to think about, and if, if I'm boring just go back to these questions. So the first question is, what is the computing power of the universe? If you could turn the universe into one big computer, what could, you know, is it going to be like a, you know, an Intel or, you know, what, 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 is it going to, what is it going to look like? How much power are you going to be able to get to it, get out of it? The second question is, how long before we reach that computational power? So just let that, let that sit in for the next few minutes. But uh, my story starts about six years ago. Um, uh, myself and, and the other co-founders of UCIC, we had dream jobs. Like, this is us, we looked, we looked a lot younger. And we, we called each other the three amigos, but um, we had dream jobs. Uh, we even like coordinated our, our colors. Like uh, we had, we had uh, no, that, that just happened. Um, but we, got, we worked for a company based in Toronto uh, that provided research and teaching equipment to universities. So we got to go around the world and visit cutting edge research labs and see like what was going to be coming in the next five to 10 years. Um, you know, here's one project that we worked on. Uh, the University of Calgary it was a teleoperation haptic joystick uh, for basically like, you know, force feedback and for, so the surgeon could work, you know, in a different city and be able to feel what they were cutting into. Uh, there was another project around, uh, you know, robotic gyroscopes to be used in unmanned vehicles. Um, so it was, it was really amazing. Like, like literally, I was, every other week I was flying around, got to, you know, see the, Grand Canyon from the air, it was just, oh sorry, this is the, uh, the Hoover Dam from, from the air, it was just amazing, like even you know, visiting like Moffett Field and some of the campuses there, I saw the, the Google plane, just amazing tales of the road. And we would come back to Toronto, every couple weeks our schedules would align and we'd go out to lunch. And we'd sit around and we'd talk about this amazing future, but when we looked around us, people were heads first into their phone. They were distracted by devices, you know, we were having these conversations about the singularity um, and they were on their way to becoming single. So it was really like, it was just kind of this dystopic type of, uh, dystopic type of, of, uh, of future that we were seeing ahead of us. And we thought, what if we could, you know, figure out a project where we get technology to fade to the background and chime in when you need it. So early 2012, we started to come up with some ideas. And uh, one of the ideas that we thought of was this device called the UBI which was a, a Wi-Fi connected voice operated computer that you could plug into a wall outlet um, and be able to, to talk to it. And um, you know, we thought you know, the technology was slowly catching up and getting to the point where it could be usable. What if we could just make a project around this? And we were obsessed with Kickstarter. So of course we went on to Kickstarter. Uh, we, we put together a, uh, like a, a, mock, a mock up of the device and, and shot the video um, and the course of Six weeks on Kickstarter, we ended up raising you know, close to a quarter million dollars. And it was incredible. Like we got all this media attention, we were in Wire, we were in TechCrunch, um, you know, we were getting all sorts of like media inquiries and it was just like something we'd never been exposed to before. But towards the end of our Kickstarter campaign, this horror started to dawn on us when we realized like we had close to 1,200 backers and we'd actually have to build this thing. And uh, then it also started to dawn on us that what we raised on Kickstarter was like a quarter of what we needed to actually deliver on the Kickstarter project. So 
um, none of us had, a, you know, we, we were good in engineering, but none of us had any background in building a consumer electronic hardware product in a new domain around voice, a technology that we only had only just become familiar with. So we were freaking out a little bit, um, but we ended up building it. We ended up, you know, first putting together our, our initial prototypes. We started to work out what would be a, a user interaction for a voice first product. Um, and then uh, how do we build microphones and use technology that's existing today? What type of sensors are we gonna use? Uh, started getting the first you know, prototypes ready. Um, I think there's a, a, a phobia called tryptophobia, which is the fear of closely placed holes. And uh, we learned that like, this is kind of like a lotus, you know, lotus flower. People get really freaked out by this. Some, some segment of the population hates that. So we didn't know that at the time, but we learned all these lessons. But we got the UB ready. Um, and close to you know, spring of 2013, there's a U of T, U of T, University of Toronto grad student who got the first UBI, you know, the first voice first device out in the market. Um, and then towards the summer of 2013, we got a bunch of people together in Toronto who were early Kickstarter backers. We sat them around a table like this. We brought in pizza. Um, we, uh, we explained to them how to set up their UBIs. We had this you know, limited beta backer edition product. And uh, we gave them the device and we said, okay, guys, go home, start, start playing with it. And a couple hours later, um, we start to see the first device connect. Oh my goodness, this device just came online. Um, and then you know, people started to, to, to actually ask the device questions. So, you know, okay, Ubi, how's the weather? And the device responded. And uh, then like, what's two plus two? Uh, or tell me a joke. And okay, this is great. This is user feedback data. This is fantastic. And then um, shortly after that, like the most obscene pornographic things that could ever be asked of any device started to, to flow in. And there was one user who was just like, oh my goodness. And I, thought, I can't believe we built this thing and like so quickly it kind of you know, degenerated into, into those type of uh, you know, queries into it. Um, I learned things that I, I shouldn't have learned. But um, that was kind of the initial, the initial <laughs> experience with the UBI. Um, but of course, we weren't the first ones to come up with the concept of, of voice interaction, ambient voice interaction. Of course, we got a lot of inspiration from, from Captain Picard. Um, uh, even other you know, sci-fi uh, movies, there was uh, you know, Back to the Future. They have this uh, you know, food hydrator where you know, the mom hydrates a pizza, level four. Mom, you sure know how to hydrate a pizza. You gotta look up that scene. Back to the future, cheese. Um, and there were other devices that were starting to come out even, you know, even back then. There was the, the Ivy device. I think I'm, I'm not mentioning Josh, you know, I should mention there, there are a lot, a lot of other devices that were, were starting to come out that were voice, a voice first. This is one called Ivy. Uh, but even going way back, you know, a couple decades before, there were a bunch of like voice interactive concepts that were out there, either, you know, you speak to the device or the device speaks back to you. You know, and, and of course, since our Kickstarter, there were a lot of other you know, voice first products that were coming to market. And then there was November 6, 2014 at 9 a.m. Um, when uh, an announcement came out uh, about this, this device, the Echo. And we were a little bit surprised when it came out, maybe not so surprised. I'll I could tell you a story about us and Amazon at some point if you liquor me up. But, um, it was, it was quite the experience. I remember getting an email at noon saying, um, from, from my brother, and it was just like the, the, the one line on it was like, uh-oh. And <laughs> we, we realized that like the world's largest retailer um, is selling their own product at a loss um, that we're competing against. And by that point, um, we already had realized that, that you know, being a consumer electronic hardware company wasn't really our fortune. Um, and uh, we had already started looking at, uh, at other um, avenues of revenue, and this kind of pushed us in that direction from you know, building our own consumer electronic hardware product to helping other people. So we went the route of something we called Ubi Cloud, which allowed other people to take our infrastructure and connect it to their hardware product. And um, we, you, know, you could, you could uh, basically send a voice request and you would get back, you'd get back, a, voice, uh, you'd get back a voice response. Um, we started to shop it out to, uh, to a lot of device makers. We said, you know, build Ubi Cloud into your product. And they would tell us, you know, I'm not so sure. You know, what about the license price? How much is it going to cost? Uh, and th then sure enough, six months later, there was a service called Alexa Voice Service uh, that came out that offered it for free. And we're like, come on, Amazon. Like, 
give us a break here. Um, but at that point, we decided, okay, we're not going to fight this <laughs> behemoth, and we're going to embrace it, and we're going to help people implement um, AVS in, into their products and tie it with skills. So that was you know, our journey to get to our, our current model. Um, and what we're about to see is a huge number of voice-first devices hit the market. And what's driving that? Of course, there are these big services you know, from Amazon and Google that allow for embedding voice into, into third-party hardware. But what we're seeing, there's some other technologies that are coming out that are making uh, voice really ubiquitous. Um, so if you look at the, uh, at the idea of a voice interaction chain, the voice chain, um, any voice first product looks, works like this. You have, at the beginning, some type of audio processing that allows for far field interaction. It takes your, your voice and it you know, removes different elements in order for it to, in order for a microphone to be able to, you know, pick up the voice clearly, um, digital signal processing. Um, and then there's typically some type of uh, trigger, tr trigger engine that's uh, listening for a trigger word, whether it's Alexa or OK Google. In our case, it was OK Ubi. Sometimes that runs on the DSP. Sometimes that runs on an application processor. Um, then the device wakes up. It listens for the audio. And it converts that to text. So there's speech, speech to text engine. Um, then we need to figure out how to use that. So there's some type of natural language understanding engine um, that will take the, the phrase and turn it into some type of intent. Once you know that the person wants to turn on a light, you then have an integration with some type of service. You fulfill the, the request, and then you send it back to the device, and you get some type of acknowledgment. And typically, that's in text-to-speech or speech synthesis. The last step is usually feed that audio signal uh, back into that DSP in order to do acoustic echo cancellation so you can actually speak over the device. So uh, many of you probably already know this, but I figured I would, I would throw it up here just as a, a quick primer. Um, AVS, Alexa Voice Service, does all of this in the middle parts of it. So you simply ship it audio, you get back audio. So the result is now, if I want to build a voice-first product, I don't need to build all of these components. I just need to build the front side of it to process the audio um, and to receive it back. Um, and then I can let AVS, I can build like an, an Echo-like product. Um, now, there is a possibility of building your own um, you know, custom product, but you have to build more components. And there are a lot of providers. One, one of them is Amazon Lex and Amazon Poly. Uh, both, give, uh, um, you know, both give solutions for that. But there are probably half a dozen other um, kind of common providers for it. But what's allowing for, um, for hardware makers to, make, uh, to, to put voice on their product is that there's a, there's a big jump in the number of suppliers of this digital signal processing technology. And uh, what we're seeing is that when, when we were building that Ubi product, um, we were getting quotes of $2 million to build our own you know, custom DSP engine. And it was going to be like $15 in terms of bill of material costs. To, to add it to our product, which is just, you know, that ends up being an additional $50 at retail um, for, for a product. It just wasn't feasible. But today, you know, there are you know, at least a dozen providers of DSP technologies, and it's driving down the cost. So for, you know, several tens of thousands of dollars, and maybe, you know, $5, you can have, you know, far field voice interaction that's comparable to, to the Echo. You know, two mics, up to eight mics. Some people just add mics to, like, like, they think it's like horsepower. Oh, this one has 12 mics. It's an amazing system. But, um, so this is one technology, one, one reason why we're, we're going to see a bunch of products hitting the market. The other uh, commodity uh, or commoditization um, is around these speech trigger engines. So uh, these used to be very difficult to, uh, to use, and they also uh, were very bad. Uh, but nowadays, they're, they're improving significantly, and the number of them is also proliferating. So every couple of months, you'll end up with another local uh, speech, um, speech triggering engine that's, that's coming out. Some are better than others, uh, but that's what's driving it. So we're seeing devices like this one, like the uh, Fabrique speaker, um, that basically they just buy a chip, they put it into their product, and now it, it runs like the Echo. It, it, uh, and, and if you look, do a quick search on, on Amazon, you're seeing you know, a number of these uh, Alexa-enabled or Alexa-powered uh, products that are coming to market. And there, there's, you know, several dozen, if not 100 different brands that are now out there selling 
uh, Alexa speakers that function like the Echo. So there are a lot of choices. I think last year there was a, de it's a device called the, the UFI or UFI that was actually cheaper than a dot. It was $20. So like this is really driving down the price. And what we're likely going to see in the next year is that the number of third-party Alexa endpoints is going to outnumber the number of devices that Amazon is shipping with, with Alexa built into it. So that's, that's a prediction that we're, we're going to see in the next, the next year, just the, by the sheer volume of, of devices that are being shipped out. But what's really cool about this is that you can get all sorts of different types of interfaces for Alexa. So this was a concept a couple years ago called the Pebble Core. That was like a badge that you could wear that had Alexa built into it. Unfortunately, it never shipped, so this idea is still you know, hot if anyone wants to run with it. Um, but you're seeing uh, several device makers come out with light switches that have Alexa built into it. So now it's everywhere. Now you can, you can put it in your kitchen. You don't need to have a whole you know, dedicated device. Um, the, the next, uh, okay, the, the next uh, type of device is thermostats. So this is a fellow Toronto company, Ecovee, that, uh, that has a Alexa-enabled thermostat, and there's, you know, there are more that are coming to, uh, to market. So what's also driving this is that there, there are new tools that are coming out that allow hardware makers to add voice to, um, to their products. So kind of the point that I'm pushing is that there are going to be a lot of voice-first products on the market. Um, so if you're developing a skill, or you know, say this is going to work the same way with with um, with Google Assistant, or you're developing an action for Google, how can you start developing this when you're thinking about voice just being everywhere? So this is a uh, device is called the um, well, I think it's called the Alexa button, but. This is kind of one new interface that right now works with Echoes. Basically, you can, um, you can you know, have like a Jeopardy type of buzzer, um, and you could power it. Imagine this is available for every Alexa-enabled device. Not first of all, not just for, for interacting with Echoes or skills, uh, but any Alexa-enabled device. The second thing, imagine other interfaces being able to communicate with your skill, send, you know, send, send responses to your skill, by some type of physical input that are not these Amazon devices. So, you know, some type of button, maybe it's a, maybe it's a switch somewhere. So, so that's, that's kind of one possibility that's going to come from, uh, from, from Amazon. Um, the other kind of big thing that, that I think people are just starting to get aware of is this idea of the Alexa gadget SDK, where you can now communicate from the Alexa skill to a physical object and have it command it in unison together with what's happening on, on the skill. So um, there's a couple of companies that are, that are already starting to build you know, interactive toys. So if you imagine you know, a skill is saying, you know, the cow says, and then you could have a toy that actually plays out you know, moo or something like that. So, so you can build this really cool inter interactions. The other big trend is going to be a lot more uh, screen and visual based uh, devices that have these assistants built into them. So right now, the show is the big one. There's, uh, there's the Fire TV. But third party devices are going to also have, these, uh, have the ability to display information back. And so what can people start to do to really take advantage of that? Is it you know, playing a video? Is it uh, prompting? You know, is, it, is it showing some type of picture or information along with the response that comes back from it? And the other kind of big thing to start thinking about is multi-input. Uh, multi so if you have um, you know, the ability to also not only receive back a visual in, um, interaction, but also be able to, to push a response back, physically touch it. So what we're likely going to see in the next five, 10 years is that instead of people having these dedicated speakers, um, you know, the, this is my echo. It's a big tower that I put in the middle of a, of a table. You're going to see something that looks more like this, where you can't see anything. It doesn't look like, doesn't look like there's any voice first product there. You just walk into an environment, and you can talk to it. So if I'm a developer and I'm thinking about this, let's just kind of think of some, some ideas here. So um, Crystal Pepsi. You know, uh, I'm going to pitch Crystal Pepsi uh, on building an Alexa skill. 
I could tell them, you know, the basic stuff would be, oh, we're going to build you a skill for, for a contest. Someone's going to rip off the label. They're going to read a phrase at the back of it to their Alexa skill. That's kind of table stakes now. Like, uh, maybe that's, that's kind of Alexa skill building 1.0. The future could be that you have you know, some type of internet connected lights or internet connected de uh, device that can actually ch have it change colors or interact with someone uh, based on, um, you know, based on um, um, something that the user said to a skill. So, so actually have a physical object you know, change as a result of, of interacting with a skill. Um, similarly, if people have home automation devices, um, they'll be able to control, the skills might be able to control those home automation devices as well. So imagine if there's a you know, story time and you have Philips Hue, that you can actually build this interaction around the, the Philips, Philips Hue light. Um, I'll just speed it up really quickly because I know I'm, I'm going into the next session. Um, there's already examples of people who are building books um, that you can interact with a skill. But uh, just this week, there was a, a, a game board called When in Rome that came out that actually is a physical game board that interacts with, uh, with an Alexa skill. So the other thing to start thinking about is, is you know, right now you can just have, you just get you know, text information or intent information back from, from your, your Alexa device. But what if you got a lot more? What if you got biometrics? So you're able to authenticate the user. This is definitely you know, Joe who's interacting with my skill right now. Uh, or I'm able to get emotion or I'm able to get you know, gender, ethnicity, or age, other kind of information about the, the user back. It might be scary, um, but you know, what if I could tailor my skill, that interaction to, to that user and customize it a lot more? So I'm not just assuming everyone is the same when they're interacting with, uh, with my skill in different ways. So this information will be probably exposed in some way to skill builders in the future. But the other big thing is when you're thinking about a, a device, um, Think about this kind of ubiquitous voice interaction, that it's no longer a single individual's device. All Alexa endpoints belong to anyone, really, that you can walk up to, uh, to, to your friend's device and talk to it, and the device knows it's you based on uh, maybe multi-factor ver verification, based on your voice or based on the fact that your cell phone's close to it. So how do you start developing kind of these skills or actions uh, thinking about how someone from anywhere could just walk in and talk to it, and you have to know what you know what's happening to that user. Okay, so back to the questions at the beginning. You guys remember what they were? If not, I'll I'll just remind you really quickly. So, what's the computing power of the universe? How long is it going to take for us to get there? And what does this have to do with anything? Why you, why are we bring this up? So, first, real quick thing is you know you want to find out the computing power of the universe. You look at the computing. Uh, Computational uh, computations per second of one kilogram of matter, uh, and then you just multiply it by the matter in the universe. Really simple, you know, Nobel Prize type, you know, equation that you can get. But uh, there are a couple of different sources for it. People like Ray Kurzweil, or they roll their eyes at Ray Kurzweil that he has a number for this based on quantum computing, what you can kind of grab from one kilogram of matter. Uh, there's this guy named Fred Hoyle who came up with an estimate for the amount of matter in the universe, and you multiply it together, you get you know, eight to the ten to the hundred two computations per second, which is let's just let's just round it. We'll call it one Google flops. All right, that's that's the computational power of the universe potentially. I could be completely wrong. Um, the next thing you think about is how long will it take before we actually get there? So, um, you know, you can look at you can look at Moore's law. Um, Moore's law, of course, has to do with uh, you know with, with uh, you know something else, density of transistors. It doesn't have to do with uh, you know computational power doubling, but let's assume it does, uh, and that you know basically we're going to see a doubling of computation power every uh, every two years. So how long before we get to you know one gig one Google flops? So to 2011, you know this was the the record you know eight petaflops. Um, you know, 2018, you know, we're actually following Moore's law in that respect and computation power, I think, is, again, it's something it's different than Moore's law, but um, 93 petaflops. Um, so if we take that, how, how many doublings to get to one Google flop? Turns out it's 123. So unfortunately, that means by in 246 years, we're going to reach the computational power of the universe. So um, when you think about building a skill, um, kind of bring it back to Earth. When you think about building a skill, 
uh, at least you can, you know, you think about the amount of computational power that's going to be available uh, to us developers to be able to build with. You know, we don't need to think about kind of interacting with voice, but how do we interact with intelligence around us? How are we able to build these kind of interesting interactions based on all this knowledge that's going to be available for us? So I'm going to stop there, and thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to come out. Thank you.